So in this video, we're going to be talking about the supercontinent cycle, or the process by which the continents of the Earth change and drift away from their original position to be spread around the world. One of the reasons why I talked about mountain ranges in the last video is because these mountain ranges can sometimes be evidence of different things which are happening with the supercontinent cycle. In the same way that rifts can also be evidence of continents that separated, mountain ranges can be evidence of continents which are colliding, or plates which are colliding. And so, by looking at both rifts and mountain ranges and trenches together, we can paint a picture of the history of the continents around the Earth. And we can also do this by dating rocks, looking at climatological evidence, puzzle pieces, fossils, and rock formations. All the things we talked about in the beginning of these videos when we talked about continental drift theory, which include mountain ranges, trenches, and rifts, you can actually get a picture of what the continents look like. And this is pretty much the study of geology, which is very, very challenging because it's, it goes back so far in the past that it's really hard to make a really good, accurate prediction. And there's a lot of theories that try to explain how this works. So what I'm going to present to you right now is going to be a hypothesis at best. And we're going to have a lot of evidence to support these hypotheses. But I would be, it would be a stretch to say that it's actually really well-founded research. Now, since Pangaea, we have a lot of data. But if you go back before Pangaea, then it's when it starts getting iffy and there's a lot of variation in what scientists think happened. But the last supercontinent cycle we know a lot about, and that's the one you see in the screen right now. The, we, we, I'm referring to this, the cycle that started with Pangaea breaking apart because of a rift, and then eventually you end up with something that looks like it looks today. And this is pretty much what happened since the Permian period, which started about 225 million years ago. This is not a very, very long time. In geological time, you're talking billions of years of Earth's history, there's way more that can be talked about, and these continents came from somewhere. And so the supercontinent cycle actually starts way before that. All you see here in the screen is the last steps of this cycle. So let's talk about that. Remember in the last video, we talked about how continents form. So in the beginning, basically you have these scattered pieces of growing crust coming from hot spots, um, and other processes such as terrain accretion, coral reefs, and other things which are creating. And these things are rifting and drifting, folding and faulting, climate is changing, you have hot spots forming here and there, so you have the formation of all kinds of structures, including shoes, cratons, platforms, oregons, extended crust, domes, terrains, basins, all the things we talked about, large igneous provinces, but it all started, according to scientists, about 3 billion years ago with isolated pieces of rock that we called Ur. Now, if you, see, if you look at Ur, you will see that it's actually only small pieces of land that barely qu qualify as one continuous landmass. And these pieces of land include smaller pieces which are still around today, and you see that they are marked in red. Later on, a different piece, far away, form, and we call that piece Octica, and that was another one of the earlier continents, and it was actually made of smaller pieces, and you can call, see them there, and some of these pieces again went on becoming the part pieces that are still around today. And you also have Atlantica, which is another continent that, that developed separately from Ur and Arctica on separate parts of the world, and again, these pieces were smaller pieces which were formed, and some of these pieces are still around today. But notice how pieces such as Brazil and San Francisco were, all were, were near each other. And that makes crazy scenarios because if you think about it, this piece must have traveled a really, really long way to end up where it is later uh, in the nor near the Canadian Craton. So the San Francisco Craton ended up somewhere close to the Canadian Craton. So as you can see, there's been a lot of drifting and motion happening over the last, for over billions and billions of years. Another one that you have is Nina. Now, Nina is a, developed about 1.8 billion years ago, and it was another one of those early continents, which was, again, built of smaller pieces of supercontinents. And Nina was basically alteration of Arctica, when Arctica grew more by accretion processes, and each of the pieces in Arctica grew, you end up getting something like Nina. Meanwhile, Atlantica was also developing, and Ur was also still developing and getting larger and larger. And so... By, by the 1.8 to 1.5 billion years ago, you have something that looks like Colombia. When you have the large, large and large Nina, which by now has changed, by the way, as you can see, it's rotated. And Ur is going to be larger than before and have b bigger pieces, which also got together. And then you have Atlantica, a little more organized as well. Now, these three pieces will then converge together and form Rodinia which is the first original supercontinent. Now, I want you to understand that this particular thing here is what I referred to before that I meant is a little iffy. Remember that we know 
that there was these continental blocks form of smaller pieces. So what I want you to understand is that smaller pieces got together to form each one of these continents. Ur, Arctica, which then changed into Nina, and, Ant and Atlantica. And then these continents drifted around the Earth and eventually collided with each other to form uh, Colombia. And as they, they got even closer together, they eventually got bigger and bigger and formed Rodinia, which then shattered again. Um, but why are these things moving around? Remember, because of tectonic plate motions. But I want you to understand that the plates which were moving and creating these things are not necessarily the same place they exist today. Because much of these plates have subducted, new plates have formed in ocean ridges. New ridges form as continents collide against each other. Because imagine, when you have two large blocks, for example, when you have Columbia forming, and Ur, Atlantica, and Nina all colliding against each other, and all these rocks fuse together by terrain accretion, you form one ginormous craton. But then, this crate is under so much pressure, because the plate is colliding against each other, that new rifts form, or new cracks form in between that, and then that can be a rift that can then spread the continents apart. So, you know, it's almost like every time you get a supercontinent, it actually sets us on failure, because the, the, the continent gets pressed together, causing it to crack in half, and then that crack becomes a, a mid-ocean ridge that it sp spreads it apart again. But then, if, since the world is a sphere, if they're spreading apart for again, eventually they will hit each other on the other side. As, you know, and then the process restarts. And that's why you have a supercontinent cycle. So it's almost inevitable that as pieces grow in different hotspots, they end up hitting each other, forming larger continents. And that's how you get Ur, and Arctica, and Antarctica, and then Arctica changes into Nina, and then all of these pieces end up hitting together because ultimately, if the continents are going to be moving around, they're going to end up hitting each other. Because the Earth is a sphere, so... Uh, there's the only way to do it. Then you also have the breakage of these pieces because after they collide, too much pressure causes them to crack and separate again. And so this is the early supercontinent cycle and nobody really expects you to guys to know this kind of information and the real, the real reason why I'm presenting it to you is for you to understand that the history of the Earth goes back way, way before the actual Pangaea thing. These smaller pieces evolved way before and then you have these smaller continents and Pangaea is actually made of pieces that broke off of Rodinia. And so you have these original pieces that made these original continents that got together to form something like Colombia, and then Colombia got to get really together to form Rodinia, which then broke apart and, and traveled around. And then much later, billions of years later, you get Pangaea. And I want to point out that these things include lots of the things that we have still today. For example, in, in Earth, you have pieces of India, Australia, Antarctica, Zimbabwe, and other pieces of Africa. In Atlantica, you have lots of the Africa. All of Northwest Africa and South America is going to be there in Atlantica. And you also have Nina, which includes pieces of Siberia, and which is part of Russia today, uh, Baltica, which is part of North uh, Europe, and you have Greenland and North America. So all of these things are going to become part of Rodinia, and you're going to see those things today. And we're going to keep this color coding that you see on the screen, green for Atlantica, red for Nina, and pink for Ur, as we go through the formation of Rodinia and its separation until we get to Pangaea. So as you can see here, you have Rodinia forming at about, already formed completely by around 800 million years ago. Now remember that this process started about 1.5 billion years ago, and by 800 million years ago, you would know it kind of looks like this. And we know this because we actually took, take a notice of the rock formations which are present in some of our continents today. And we can realize that some of these rock formations seem to indicate that these things used to be together. For example, you can see here that there's evidence that India, Australia, and East Antarctica were once together because of rock formations that seem to connect them as puzzle pieces. The same thing can be said about Kalahari, Congo, Amazonia, Baltica, all which share a particular rock formation around its edges. So by studying the mountain belts, which are very, very old, you can find a kind of piece together the, the pieces of how Rodinia used to look like. And by the way, remember that before this period, which you're talking about no life on land, there is already life in the oceans. Um, and by now, we actually have development of multicellular life and even some early invertebrates happening in the oceans already. But the oceans are the only place which are hospital enough, enough to support life because the atmosphere of the Earth doesn't have an oxygen rich atmosphere it cannot really support the life forms that we see today early in the cambrian time which is extends as early as three billion years from the first formations of the continents 
around 3.5 billion years to be ex exact, is what we think the first life forms on Earth evolved. Now, since the first unicellular life evolved, they it changed into multicellularity, and then finally, actually, first eukaryotic life, and then you get multicellularity, and then we start getting early invertebrates. And by the time Rodinia is formed, you still at that stage. You don't have a lot of life on Earth. At the end of the Cambrian period is where you would finally find this. But we're still in pre-Cambrian time over here. Now, Rodinia will start to break apart about 750 million years ago. And you can see that this happened because of rifts that form in between the continental pieces because of the pressure that was built because of the continent hitting each other. All this craters colliding caused a massive pressure that ended up actually cracking a continent in several pieces. Because of this, the continent was forced to travel in several di different directions and the pieces kind of separated from each other. And we know how they separated by studying paleomagnetism like we talked about before, looking at, at how the rocks actually form in these rifts and by studying the pale paleomagnetic structure of, of ancient earth rifts. And so we all, we, scientists now know that whatever configuration where Virginia had, it kind of probably started breaking up about 750 million years ago. And remember, we still have no life on an land at this time. Fast forward about another 100 million years, you get the formation of a new supercontinent called Pinocchio. It's kind of like the same pieces that we used to be together in Virginia, but they got together in another place, a little a little towards the southern hemisphere. And uh, while Virginia was a little more tropical or uh, area. So the continents kind of shifted towards the bottom of the earth. And fast forward another 100 million years, at the earlier Cambrian time, you have the formation of Gondwana. By the Cambrian time, remember, life in the ocean is exploding, we have lots of invertebrates, and this is happening. And Gondwana formed as the pieces that used to belong to Nina actually separated from, from Panosia. By the way, you can track here, let me just go back really quick, while talking about the breakup, you can track the pieces that we talked about before. All of these pieces were basically pieces that belong to Ur. So these are some pieces that belong to Ur. Then we have some pieces here that belong to Atlantica. And we also have some pieces that belong to Nina. And you see how these pieces end up separating and reshuffling because of continental drift caused by tectonic plate motion, rifts, and things that we already talked about. Now, by, time, by the time you get to Panosha, you can still see the same patterns that we talked about before. Look, you still have the large blocks that form that used to form Atlantica over here. You have the, f the large blocks that used to form Nina, which include Laurentia, Baltica, and Siberia, and you have the blocks that used to form Ur. Eventually, these blocks will, will separate, and basically the blocks that were part of Nina will separate because of this Ieptos Ocean formed by a rift. More rifts will happen later on at the late Cambrian, early Ordovician, where pieces of Gondwana will actually separate from Gondwana, and you can see that's happening here with a piece that we call Avalonia and another piece called Turkish, which would then form new oceans in between these pieces. And by the middle Ordovician, this is kind of how the world looks like. Now, the interesting thing is that by the Ordovician, like enough algae and cyanobacteria have already gathered in the oceans to make so much oxygen that the atmosphere starts to change and become oxygen rich, allowing the early life leaps towards the land. And we'll talk about that later. 